Okay, welcome to quantum mechanics. This is module six, lecture one. We're gonna solve the problem, the quantum mechanics problem of a particle on a circle, and it's subtitled quantum goes round and round. All right, so let's get you oriented on how we describe a particle on a circle. The way that we do this is we essentially map a one dimensional line segment with periodic boundary conditions to a circle. And some people do find this geometry a little bit hard to follow. So here's our line. It extends from 0 to L. And if we identify the endpoints, so the point L is the same as the point 0, then that is the same as wrapping that line around itself into a circle. And this is the way that we will do that. And so we say that it has periodic boundary conditions so that the point at L is identical to the point at 0. And then what we have done is we've mapped the problem onto a circle. All right, so I'm going to teach you about the factorization method. This is a method that was developed by Schrodinger in 1940 and 1941. And it solves these quantum mechanics problems using manipulations of operators. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. In this first implementation of the factorization method, you shouldn't be overly concerned about where the idea for this factorization came from, but just be sure that you follow the steps that we use to actually get to the solution and that you understand how and why we actually obtain the solution of the problem using this method, okay? So the problem has motion only along the one dimension, and so the Hamiltonian for the free particle is just the kinetic energy. So it's just P squared over 2m, I have the momentum only in the one dimension. This is along the axial or tangential direction around the circle, and there's no potential at all in the problem. The factorization method has as its goal the factorization of the Hamiltonian into a form that looks like A dagger A plus E. The A and the A dagger are two operators. They are not Hermitian operators. So A dagger is the Hermitian conjugate of A. And E is a number. If you like, I could have put in a identity or unit operator multiplying the E. But as I had mentioned before, we often suppress that because it just becomes a little bit cumbersome to carry those identity operators around. And for all intents and purposes, it really does just act like a number. And so we don't really need to carry that identity operator around with us. So this factorized form is a very special form of the Hamiltonian. And the way that we do this is we construct a ladder operator. These AK and AK daggers are called ladder operators that has the form that's given here. It's 1 over the square root of 2m times the momentum operator p hat minus i h bar k times this function w of k prime x. And now k is a wave number that has dimensions of one over length. And w is a real valued function that has a name. It's called the superpotential. And so both the k and the k prime are numbers. So k prime x hat is dimensionless because the k has dimensions of one over length. And of course, the position has dimensions of length. Furthermore, the object that I'm adding, because the w is a dimensionless function, the object that I'm adding is h bar k. But h bar k is the Planck's constant divided by a length. And the Planck's constant divided by a length has dimensions of momentum. So I'm adding something with dimensions of momentum to the momentum operator. And of course, that makes sense. We put the i in there on purpose so that when you take the dagger, the only thing that happens, because P is Hermitian, and X is Hermitian, and W is a real valued function, the only thing that changes is the sign of the I. So the A dagger operator looks exactly the same, but has the minus I changed into a plus I. All right, so here's just a summary of what we said on the previous page. Now, how do we figure out what the superpotential would be? We just plug into that formula and force it to work. So let's plug into that formula. And here I've substituted in the AK dagger and the AK. And eventually, we'll be adding an EK to get the Hamiltonian itself. But for the moment, we're going to just look at the piece 
of the Hamiltonian, the AK dagger AK. As I mentioned before, taking the dagger only changes that minus sign to a plus sign. So there I've done that. And now I have a multiplication. It's just a FOIL method that we use to do the multiplication. And you can see this is what we get. So we'll get a P squared term. We'll get an I H bar K W times P. We'll get an I H bar K minus I H bar K P times W. And then we'll get a plus H bar squared K squared W squared. So the P squared and the W squared terms, those are the terms that are the squares of terms. And the other two terms are cross terms. But I cannot cancel them out because those are operators. And so the order matters in an operator. And if you look carefully at it, you can see we actually have a commutator sitting there. So let's evaluate that commutator. And indeed, this is the generic form for AK dagger AK when I write my ladder operator in the form that is written there, 1 over square root of 2m p hat minus i h bar k w of k prime x hat. OK, so our goal is to come up with a guess for the w, evaluate this expression, and get the thing into the form that is equal to the Hamiltonian. Now, you might think for the free particle, what I want to do then is to actually make that thing equal 0. But that isn't really what I want to do, because there's a constant that I can add in. And so what I really want is I want that thing to equal a number. And I really want it to be a negative number so that I have to add a positive number to get the Hamiltonian. In fact, I'm really required to do that because p squared over 2m, that's a positive operator. All its eigenvalues have to be positive. And so that ek must be positive. So I have to choose a factorization that will give me a positive ek. Okay, this is the reason why I could not do p plus i h bar k, which is then p minus i h bar k for the a dagger. You might have thought that that would work, but then the number that comes out for the a dagger k, a k is positive, and that means the e k must be negative to give me p squared over 2m, and that won't give me a correct solution. So the reason why we have to work hard is because we need this a k dagger a k to equal p squared over 2m minus a positive number. And I'm going to show you how we do that. But it's not so obvious exactly how that will work. So we have to compute the commutator of the momentum with the superpotential in order to compute this operator. And then, of course, we have to add the square of the superpotential to that. Now, it turns out that the correct solution is going to involve a trigonometric function of x. And so we need to figure out how do we evaluate commutators of trigonometric functions of x. And this is not a trivial thing to do. And we have to figure out precisely how we're going to do it. It turns out that the Hadamard lemma comes to our rescue in helping us figure out how to evaluate this commutator. This is by no means obvious, so I'm going to carefully go through how this works. So let's first recall the baby Hadamard lemma. It's really also an official Hadamard lemma because you can evaluate the commutator of x with p. But it has this form with an exponential. Here I put a minus sign on the exponential on the left and a plus sign on the right. And when you evaluate this via Hadamard using all those nested commutators, the series truncates after the first term. And so you get p hat plus h bar k. Or if you remember how we derived this with the baby Hadamard using the expansion of the exponential in a power series and evaluating the commutator of p with one of the exponentials and then rewriting it in this form, both ways work. In fact, we're going to go back to that commutator form, which was the way that we derived the baby Hadamard identity. And you can see what we have here is p, the commutator of p, p hat, the momentum with e to the i k x hat is equal to h bar k e to the i k x hat. And that's an identity that we have worked out. What we're going to do is we're going to use the Euler identity to now transform this into commutators with trig functions. So e to the i k x is just cosine kx plus i sine kx. And you might ask, well, can I do that with operators? Of course I can. They're just defined in terms of the power series. And it equals h bar k times cosine kx plus i sine kx. So how do I get the new identity? I'm going to just equate the real and imaginary parts. But there's a little bit of a trick here when we do this. When we equate the real and imaginary parts, we have to remember that the commutator of two real functions, a real function p 
uh, or I'm sorry, the momentum operator P with a real function of X is an imaginary number. So the commutator of P with cosine KX is imaginary, and the commutator of P with I sine KX is actually real. So we have to put that in, we have to remember that that's what comes out in order to properly equate the real and imaginary parts. So when we do that, we get that the commutator of P with cosine KX, that's going to equal the imaginary part of the right-hand side. So that's IH bar K sine KX. And IP commutator with sine KX, that's going to equal the real part, which is H bar K cos KX. And now I just multiply that by minus I in the second term. And when you look at this, you see it actually looks like the derivative of the thing that's in the commutator multiplied by IH bar K. Remember? I'm sorry, that should be multiplied by minus i h bar. Remember the cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus k sine kx, and of sine kx, its derivative is cosine, a k cosine kx. And so if each of those is multiplied by minus i h bar times the derivative, that's actually what the commutator is. And we'll have a little bit more to say about that later in the lecture. All right, we've gotten those commutators done. Let's work out the next two trig functions. So we're going to work them out using the Leibniz formula. So we're going to have a cosine kx times a secant of kx. Remember, secant is 1 over cosine. So that product is equal to 1. That means the commutator is equal to 0. Now we use Leibniz to expand that into the two terms. I pull a cosine out to the left, and I pull a secant out to the right. I know what the co commutator of p with cosine is, so I can just evaluate that using the result from above. And now I'm going to collect terms. I'm going to move the terms without the commutator onto the right-hand side. And now I'm going to multiply by secant kx on the left-hand side. And indeed, we've now derived this commutator. I'm going to just simplify it. And you see that the commutator of p with secant kx is minus i h bar k tangent kx times secant kx. This looks like a derivative again. Remember, the derivative of secant is k tangent kx secant kx. And so that observation that we saw before is continuing to hold. All right, let's move on to do it for the cosecant. We do the same thing, multiply by one trick. That commutator is equal to 0. We use Leibniz, pulling one term out to the left, the other out to the right. We substitute in the commutator of p with sine kx from above. We then rearrange by moving terms to the right-hand side, multiplying by cosecant kx and simplifying, and we get IH bar K cotangent KX cosecant KX. And indeed, this is the same thing that we would get with the derivative again. So we've now gotten four of the six trig functions. We have two to go. Let's work with the tangent. We can rewrite the tangent as a product of the sine with the secant. Then we use Leibniz again, pulling the sine out to the left and the secant out to the right. We substitute in for both of those commutators. We have both of them in our table above. And now we just simplify. We're going to factor out uh, minus i h bar k. We're left with a tan squared kx plus 1. But there's an identity, tan squared kx. Tan squared is sine squared over cosine squared. If I add 1 to that, I'm going to get sine squared plus cosine squared in the numerator divided by cosine squared. And that's just equal to 1 over cosine squared. So this becomes minus i h bar k secant squared kx. So we're done with tangent. And now we have one left. It's the cotangent. We do it the same way. We write this as a cosine times a cosecant. We then use the Leibniz rule. We substitute in from above. And then we recognize that there's an identity here. We figure out what that identity is. And then we're left with the final result. And the commutator of P with cotangent kx hat is IH bar k cosecant squared kx hat. OK. We've actually figured out all of six of those commutators. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not a coincidence that these results can be written in terms of the commutator of p with f of x is minus i h bar the derivative of f of x, where f prime of x is the derivative of f with respect to x. This actually comes about using that representation of momentum in terms of the derivative, which we talked about in an earlier class exercise. But we can also calculate the commutators the way that we've done it here, and I actually prefer doing it this way because I really feel like I understand exactly how all the different manipulations work, and it gives me a chance to exercise using that Leibniz identity. All right, this is going to be a long lecture again, and so this is a good time to take a break if you would like to take a break. We're now going to use these commutators that we've worked out 
in working out how to solve the problem for the particle on the circle. Okay, if you took a break, I'm glad that you're back. I've rewritten all of those commutative rules on the top. We're going to choose for the superpotential tan k x hat. And I'm going to show you that this will make the factorization work. So our raising operator, a k hat, is 1 over square root of 2 m p hat minus i h bar k tangent of k x hat. And now let's go ahead and evaluate that commutator. So a dagger k a k. I have the p squared, the minus i h bar k commutator of p with the tangent, and the h bar squared k squared tangent squared. For the commutator of p with a tangent, I just look up in the table, minus i h bar k secant squared kx, substitute that in, and now I have to recognize that there's an identity that is lurking there, secant squared minus tangent squared. That is going to become one, uh, it's going to become equal to um, one minus sine squared over cosine squared, one minus sine squared is cosine squared, so that is going to just equal one. And lo and behold, we have a number, and see it's a negative number here. So this is how we get that identity that we were trying to get, where a dagger k, a k is equal to p squared over 2m minus a positive number. All right, what that tells us is now is that the Hamiltonian is a k dagger a k plus e k, where e k is h bar squared k squared over 2m. And my claim is that this solves the problem, okay? I'm sure you don't see it just yet, so let me describe to you how this does this. The eigenvalue of the energy turns out to be EK. When we find a state that satisfies what we call the subsidiary condition, which is that AK acting on psi is equal to zero. Remember, AK is an operator, so I'm going to find a state that is annihilated by AK. If you remember, I talked about the fact that when states are annihilated by operators, it's really special, and we can do really special things with it. And this is behind the idea of factorization. We need to find this state that is annihilated by the operator. And I'm going to show you how we actually find that state a little bit later in the lecture. But let's suppose that we have found that state. Now when we operate h on that state, it's equal to a dagger k, a k plus e k. I'm going to distribute that. I'm going to get an a dagger k, a k psi plus e k psi. Now, ak psi is equal to zero, so that term is gone. It's annihilated by the ak. I'm left with ek psi. And so you see h acting on psi is equal to ek times psi. That's an eigenvalue eigenvector relation with the eigenvalue given by ek, just like I said it was going to be. And so we have now found an eigenvalue for this equation. And I actually am going to tell you that we've actually solved it for all eigenvalues, because all we have to do is vary k and we get all of the solutions. But it's going to turn out we can't take every possible solution k, and we're going to describe how that works in just a moment. Okay? The way that we find out what the restriction on k is is to invoke what is called a boundary condition. So to, to figure out the right way of invoking the boundary condition, I have to find out what the wave function is. So let's look at our wave function. Psi k of x is just the overlap of the position eigenstate with psi. We're going to do it the same way we did it before. We're going to write it in terms of this translation operator, e to the i over h bar x p hat acting on the position eigenstate at the origin. We're going to now do a power series expansion of the exponential, and I'm going to pull out all the extraneous terms that aren't operators and focus only on the operator in that matrix element. We know some facts about p hat and psi. We just showed that it was an eigen value eigenvector relationship with the Hamiltonian. That means p squared acting on psi is equal to 2m e k times psi. And the subsidiary condition tells us that p hat acting on psi is equal to i h bar k tangent k x hat acting on psi. And it turns out using those two facts will allow us to figure out what this expectation value is. So when n is even, we're going to replace p, p hat to the 2m by p hat squared raised to the nth power, but p hat squared acting on psi gives me 2m e k. 2m e k is just h bar squared k squared. So I'm going to get h bar squared k squared raised to the nth power, or h bar k raised to the 2mth power acting on psi. So psi is an eigenstate of p to the 2m. Now let's look at what happens when I have p to the 2m plus 1. 
Well, I can factor out the p to the 2m and use the h bar k raised to the 2mth power, but then I'm left with a p hat acting on psi, but when p hat acts on psi, it gives me an i h bar k. So I get an extra factor of i, I get an extra factor of h bar k, and I have this operator tangent k x hat acting on psi. But it turns out that's all that we need to finish this derivation. Okay? That's because tangent k x hat, x hat is a Hermitian operator, so I can act it to the left. And when it acts to the left, I have to just replace x hat by its eigenvalue, but its eigenvalue is zero. But the tangent of zero is zero, so that thing is equal to zero. And so we find all odd powers are zero, and the even powers are equal to h bar k raised to the 2m acting on psi. And so now I can pull that out as a number, and I can evaluate this summation. And the summation takes this form. I have 1 over 2m factorial ikx raised to the 2m power times the overlap of the origin at, at x times psi. That overlap is just a number. I can square the i, and I get minus 1 to the m over 2m factorial kx to the 2m. I hope you recognize that that's a function that you know. Indeed, that is cosine kx times this number. So we've just figured out what the wave function is. It's cosine kx. And the number is determined by norm normalization. We call it a normalization constant. And I'm going to show you how we do that in just a moment. So the boundary condition that we are going to impose on the particle in a circle is that the wave function is periodic. Now, we're going to investigate in class what happens if it's not periodic, because that's actually not a requirement. But we're going to look just at the wave functions where we in in introduce that periodic boundary condition onto the wave functions, and we're going to see what happens when we do that. So what we need is psi k of x plus l must equal psi k of x. That's what it means for it to be a periodic boundary condition. I am identifying the point l with the point 0. And that means cosine of kx plus kl is equal to cosine kx. And that's only going to work if kl is 2 pi times an integer. So I learn that k, the allowed values of k, are 2 pi n divided by l. So I'm going to index the k by the n. In fact, I'm going to be labeling everything by that integer n, n can be 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. I don't take it to be negative values because the negative values give me the exact same answer as if I took them to be positive values because the cosine is an even function. So back to normalization. Let's finish that off first before we move on. The probability to find a particle between x and x plus dx is given by the modulus squared of the wave function times dx. Remember, this is something we talked about when we were talking about the two-slit experiment, and we were looking at the wave function in the two-slit experiment. Since the total probability must equal 1, the normalization condition is that the integral from 0 to L dx of psi k of x modulus quantity squared is equal to 1. So we just plug in what psi k of x modulus squared is. It's this number modulus squared times cosine squared kx. But that integral is actually easy to do. You see cosine squared kx is going over a, a integer number of half periods. And whenever I integrate the square of a cosine function over an integer number of half periods, I can just replace the cosine squared by a half and multiply by the length of the integral, the interval. And so that's just equal to L over 2. And we want that to equal 1. And you see this is now going to give us an equation for that constant. What we're going to find is that constant is equal to square root 2 over L. Now, if you're very shrewd, you might have noticed that it could be multiplied by a complex phase in e to the i phi as well. It's customary to take that complex phase to equal 1 so that we don't have that extra degree of freedom. But also, as you know, those extra degrees of freedom do not enter into any of the properties that we will be looking at. All right, so let me summarize what we have done here. We have factorized the Hamiltonian in the form h is equal to a dagger n a n plus e n, where a n, my ladder operator, is 1 over square root of 2m p hat minus i times 2 pi h bar n over l times the tangent of 2 pi n over l times the operator x hat. My energy eigenvalues e n are 4 pi squared h bar squared n squared over 2 m l squared, where n runs over 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. 
we found the eigenstate satisfies the following two equations. H acting on the state is equal to four pi squared h bar squared n squared over two m l squared times psi n. That's just the energy eigenvalue times psi n. We also found that p hat acting on psi n was equal to i h bar k tangent two pi h bar n x hat over l times psi n, okay? And then finally, for the wave function, we found the wave function when it is normalized is equal to the square root of two over L cosine two pi H bar NX over L. And so this has solved our first non-trivial quantum mechanics problem, the problem of a particle on a circle, but there is a surprise. That factorization that we did is not unique. The solutions that we found are all of the even eigenfunctions. They're all of the even solutions. There's actually an infinite number of additional solutions, which are odd solutions. We have not found those yet. We're going to find them by a different factorization, and we're going to work those out in class during our class exercises. I also want to just tease you with the fact that this is just the tip of the iceberg for the factorization method. We're going to have much more to enjoy as we work through more sophisticated results in the rest of the class, and you're going to actually learn how you figure out what is the right guess to make for the latter operator so you actually can do the entire derivation on your own. And so that's what you're going to actually be learning. We're going to next treat the simple harmonic oscillator when we look at factorization of another problem. And we're going to treat that in a couple of different ways, and there are some surprises that we're going to find there as well. Okay, that now completes the first lecture of Module 6.